Practic examiners, this meeting is being held by teleconference under the governor's executive order N-29-20. The date is July 16th, 2020, and the time is 9.03 a.m. For the members of the public that are listening and would like to provide public comment by telephone, you'll be limited to two minutes unless in the discretion of the board circumstance circumstances require a longer period. Members of the public will not be permitted to yield their allotted time to other members of the public to make comments. The board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio recorded. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. We will now take roll call of the board. Dr. McLean, would you please call the roll? Yes. Dr. David Paris? Present. Dr. Dion McLean, I am present. Mr. Frank Rossi? Not present this morning yet, but will be later. Ms. Joe Azzolino? Present. Dr. Heather Dane. Present. Quorum established. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McLean. Okay, thank you. So uh, first item on the agenda, the chair's report. I'm sorry for the delay there. I'm having to scroll through lots of documents here. Um, so uh, since our last meeting, um, you know, COVID is on everyone's minds and uh, with the new rounds of shutdown in most counties, um, it's it seems to be uh, somewhat ever changing. And, but I believe, you know, as a board and staff, we've continued to operate um, under and, and meet the new demands of the COVID era and the COVID environment. Um, as you all know, we had a special meeting June 4th um, regarding pursuing emergency regulations. Uh, and those, those have been submitted and we're awaiting response from the governor's office. Um, and although we've been operating under and meeting, uh, you know, the new demands, it has slowed down business as usual um, for all of us. And that includes the board office and staff. And uh, so coming out of this meeting, one of the goals um, that I have and, and that we all have is to ramp up all the business of the board again, um, as it appears we're, we're getting adjusted and uh, we, can, we can start to take on uh, all, the, all the areas of uh, the board business. Uh, on behalf of the board recently, um, there are some meetings taking place as things open up in, in the profession. Um, Dr. Dane and I uh, attended uh, NBC NBCE Part 4 testing as uh, reps for the board. Dr. Dane in San Jose and uh, myself in Portland. And I think we'd all be proud to, to see the new campus and the progression in education facilities that uh, the new campus in Portland at University of Western States has. And uh, they've been in there three months. and. Uh, was really a pleasure to see um, that type of educational facility for chiropractic students who eventually come to California and all over. Um, I also attended um, as a board representative part four test committee uh, in June in Greeley, Colorado. And uh, the board staff, um, office and I'm sure all the other BCE members, I know uh, myself included, 
Um, we've really been inundated receiving calls, many calls from licensees and constituents with questions relating to the pandemic. And, and we've done a good job in follow up. And uh, I think we've been timely and we've been very responsive. And so I've been really proud of um, the board members and, and, uh, and I know they've taken a lot of calls and, and the staff and, and the office. Um, and finally, I would just say that we urge DCs to stay current um, and follow the CDC and California Department of Public Health guidelines. That's all I have as a report. Are there any comments, questions? I just have um, one comment I forgot to tell you, Dr. Paris, this is Dr. McLean, that I also attended the Part 4 testing, but in Dallas, and um, that it was refreshing to see that such a well-oiled machine as how it is the examination is um, carried on and the number of students that are, were there and ready. Oh, thank you for that. Um, it, it really is, I think, having you know so much of the california board representation given the size and the number of licensees and and i i really like that we were able to um spread out and and get a really wide view of of you know testing in, in different areas so um, thank you for doing that anybody else comments questions okay um thank you and so i'm going to move on to agenda item number three uh, approval of the january 7 2020 april 16 2020 and june 4 2020 board meeting minutes can i get a motion to approve i'll make a motion to approve this sergio aguino i will second that motion this is dr mcclain Thank you. Any discussion? Dr. McLean, can we call for a vote for approval? Sorry, <laughs> I forgot that's my job now. <laughs> Thank you for doing that today. <laughs> um, might have to shake me a little couple of times to remind me. Um, so I will uh, call for the vote. Dr. David Paris. Yes. Dr. Dion McLean. Yes. Mr. Frank Ristino is not present this morning yet. Dr. Sergio Azzolino. Yes. Dr. Heather Dane. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to uh, number four on the agenda, ratification of approval of license applications. Can I get a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve again, Sergio Azlino. I'll second the motion, Heather Day. Any discussion? Hearing none, Dr. McLean, can we please call the vote? Yes. Uh, Dr. Barris, it's, it's Michael Knotes. We should open for public comment ah. after each item, sir. Thank you. Thank you. My Thank apologies. You. Thank you. Is there any public comment? This is the moderator at the direction of the board. I have opened up the question and answer feature. If you would like to make a public comment, please follow the instructions that are listed on the panel. In the ask field, typically in the lower right of the WebEx screen, type I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. Any other communication will not be responded to. It is not necessary to identify yourself in order to make a public comment. 
I will take comments in the order they are received. Mr. Chair, it does not appear there are any public comments. Would you like me to close the comment box? Please, thank you. Now, regarding approval of the motion on the floor, may we vote now? Yes, can we, uh, Dr. McLean, can we please call for the vote? Certainly. Dr. David Harris? Yes. Dr. Dion McLean? Yes. Dr. Sergio Avellino? Yes. Dr. Heather Bain? Yes. The motion passes for the zero none. Dr. Frank Lucino is absent at this time. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item number five, ratification of denied license applications in which the applicants did not request a hearing. Um, were there any? I ask the board staff. Dr. Paris, this is Natalie Boyer. Yes. There are none. There are none. Okay, thank you. I'm having to You're scroll right. down mm -hmm. the ways and I didn't want to spend everyone's time getting all the way down there. Uh, moving on to agenda item number six, ratification of approved continuing education providers. <laughs> Board member Paris, or board president Paris, this is the moderator. Did you want to open agenda item five for public comment? Um, yes, please. I'm, I'm not sure. I guess I would take guidance on as to whether we would normally open it for public comment if there are none. Uh, Michael Knotes, it is an agenda item, so I guess it should be open for public comment, although there really isn't anything to comment on. Okay, thank you, Mr. Knotes. Yes, let's please open it up. This is the moderator, and at the discretion of the board, I have opened the Q&A feature for public comment. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark with a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. I'm sharing the instructions on the screen for your reference. In the Ask field, please type, I would like to make a public comment, and send it to all panelists. Any other communication will not be responded to. Board Chair, we do have an individual who would like to make a public comment. Please, thank you. A attendee that identifies himself as Marcus Strutz, your microphone is now unmuted. You will have two minutes to make your comment and will be given a 10 second warning. Your mic is okay, on. Thank you. I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure this is the appropriate time for the comment, but I'm a little confused by that. I'm Marcus Strutz, chiropractor and CE provider for the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. I'd like to make the board aware of the ongoing CE issue due to COVID. At this time, the Department of Consumer Affairs has chosen to postpone CE requirements with time extensions by extending the renewal period by six months. March through June birthdays have till September 30th to complete CE, July and August birthdays have till December 31st. By August 31st, we'll have a six month backlog of DCs needing to make up their CE. The issue is this pushing back of CE has no end in sight. And once we're able to give live seminars, it's likely social distancing will still be a requirement. This will force CE providers to give CE 
in uh, seminar rooms with double the number of CE attendees, while medium rooms are only able to seat one sixth as many CEs. Each passing month will make the backlog larger. If a DC attends a live seminar and becomes infected with COVID, the result could be devastating. Many attendees see 100 patients per week, and this extrapolates out to 200,000 Californians exposed to COVID if we see 2,000 DCs uh, in a given month in the state of California. No attendees are safe at this point, and nobody actually knows the outcome of this COVID crisis and how long it'll last. The attendees, whether elderly or immunocompromised or young and healthy, um, all DCs may become a carrier, become ill, and possibly even die. At this point, I urge the board to make changes to the rules and regulations to allow all 24 hours to be completed online for the short-term COVID period. 10 seconds. And perhaps, and perhaps for the long term as we have technology to deliver quality online CE. I propose to make these changes an agenda item for the next board meeting and urge the board to move swiftly on this issue. Thank you for your time. And again, sorry if that was not the time to say all that. Dr. Strutz, if you would like to um, take a little bit more time, I'm sure the board, we, we would be happy to let you finish. Great. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, we're just trying to figure out how to do it, right? We, uh, from, we put a Department of Consumer Affairs a waiver request in. Uh, the board did that. I did, did that, and they were all denied. Uh, so we're trying to come with strategies of how to make the 24 hours online happen, um, it's the obvious solution, um, but the path to that solution seems to be difficult at best. Um, so we're just trying to figure that out. At this point, going the rules and regulations route, although I know it's a little bit cumbersome in time, seems to be the prudent thing to do. Uh, so I'm already in communication with uh, Natalie and Robert Julio uh, in making this happen. So hopefully the board can support us with this. So uh, again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Strutz. I appreciate that, those comments. Are there any more public comments? There are no other public comments. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Moving on to agenda item number six ratification of approved continuing education providers. Can I get a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. This is Heather Dane. Sergio Aguilino, I'll second that. Is there any discussion? Hearing no discussion, moderator, can we please open this agenda item up for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened the Q&A feature for public comment. Again, please follow the instructions listed on your screen and I will take comments in the order they were received. Board Chair, it does not appear anybody would like to make a public comment. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. Dr. McClain, can we please call for the vote? Sure, regarding approval of ratification of approval, approved continuing education providers, Dr. David Paris? Yes. Dr. Dion McLean? Yes. Dr. Sergio Azzolino? Yes. Dr. Heather Dane? Yes. Um, with that, there's a 4 0 in favor of this, and therefore it passes. Thank you, Dr. McLean.
And I would like to ask that we are have the ability to take agenda items out of order and uh, have any um, any other public comment before the executive officer's report. Mr. Knutz, do I need a motion to do that? Uh, Dr. Paris, are, are you suggesting to move the item for uh, public comment on items not on the agenda? Are you taking up that item now? You can take up items out of order and that's within the discretion of the chair. Yes, yes, Michael. Yes. Uh, you, you you certainly may commence that we we had we agendized that items may be taken out of order in the uh, narrative at the end of our agenda. So the public is is certainly noticed of that. Um. So, so I'd like to take uh, agenda item number thirteen. And uh, is are is there any further public comment for items not on the agenda? Moderator, can we please open that up? This um, is the Dr. Paris. Yes. Sir Gilino here. I would just uh, state that it may be wise that we revisit that because we may have people that, regardless of them being noticed, we're not prepared to provide their public comment right now, and that may create a little bit of a challenge, um, you know, in closing the meeting. So I would just suggest we revisit if there are others that we're not prepared to discuss their agenda items right now. Uh, excuse me, this is Robert and um, I, Michael, if you, you would need to answer whether we could still do it again at the end of the meeting um, and, and have it now as well. Michael must be on mute. Um, so, this, is, this, this is Michael. Oh. This is Michael. I, 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 I do think we can have um, let me say it this way. The gentleman who spoke on public comment on a different item may be done. And, but we don't have two agenda items for public comment not on the agenda. So I don't think we can do the same agenda item twice. So I think you do need to do it now or at the end of the agenda. Or, or at another place that, that you deem appropriate, Dr. Paris. But, but certainly to members of the public, on, on other items, if you, if you would like to make a comment, you certainly can. Well, how about, how about if, I, um, if we can reopen public comment on the previous, um, the previous items that were on the agenda, and then we'll revisit um, agenda item number 13 when we get there even if just briefly. How's Mr. Knotes, is that okay? Yes, I, I, I think that will be helpful. Um, why don't we open public comment for uh, the items previously on the agenda, including I think we missed public comment on the, the minutes item. Yes, please. So if we could open, if we could open the Q&A panel, and we can have public comment on any of the preceding items or any, um, there's no limit on public comment. I will just say that in terms of the agenda items. No one's going to stop a member of the public during their, uh, during their two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Knotes. Moderator, can we please open up the public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened the Q&A feature for public comments. If you would like to make a public comment, please click the icon with a question mark with a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. We are sharing the instructions on the screen for your reference. It is not necessary to identify yourself in order to make a public comment, and I will take the comments in the order that they are received. I will now pause a moment to give the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. Um, oh, we're fine. Don't worry about that. I'm gonna... 
Board Chair, it does not appear any of our attendees are asking to make a comment. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Moving to uh, agenda item number seven, executive officer's report. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Robert Puglio. Uh, I, I just, before I start, I wanted to speak to the issue of public comment, and I apologize for the confusion with that. But um, this past Monday, uh, we were on a conference call with the director and all of the executive officers and um, the director actually recommended that board move their public comment period to the beginning of the meeting so uh, so that people who just want to come and make a comment or you know uh, bring something to the attention of the board don't have to wait um, until they don't know what time because we never know what time the meeting will end so they don't have to wait all day to to be able to make their comment and um, I mistakenly thought that you know, since it was on the agenda we could we could do it at the beginning and then still go ahead and um, have it at the end but um, anyhow um, just wanted to clarify that so for my report uh, I'm going to update you on uh, admin uh, budget licensing and enforcement issues and also IT so um, as far as administration, we uh, things are running as smoothly as can be expected right now with um, with the social distancing and us having the majority of the staff um, teleworking um, on any given day. We have we have most of the staff coming into the office two days a week and then working from home on the rest. And so we're we're adjusting to that. That's not something um, we had previously done. So there's there's a few little hiccups, but it's, it's working well overall. And we currently have um, two vacancies that we, we plan to fill um, before, before the end of the year, or at least um, begin the recruitment um, you know, in the next few months. So I don't have any other admin items unless um, any of the board members have any questions about admin. And um, the... Uh, the other item that I'm going to speak to is is our fund condition. We, um, as I've reported previously, um, we our fund is low. Uh, we even though we you know we stay within budget every year. Um, this year, um, our projection is to um, to revert or have a surplus of about two hundred thousand dollars. But but nonetheless, um, our expenditures are outpacing um, the revenue we have coming in. So we likely will. I just want to let the board monitoring this closely to make sure we don't um, have a deficit. But we likely will have to uh, raise fees in the next year, so um, the next legislative session beginning 2021. So um, that's just something we'll be working on, and I'll be updating the board. Um, at upcoming meetings. But, um, currently, we have we have about three and a half months in reserve, which is which is fine. But we're projected um, by, by the end of this fiscal year that that we just started in July one, we're projected to be down to uh, like a half of a month in reserve, and. Um, and then be in a deficit in the following fiscal year. And those projections are based on us expending our full budget, which we generally don't do. So we're probably in a little bit better shape. But nonetheless, uh, it, it, it's a situation that we have to monitor closely. And um, again, uh, a fee increase likely will be uh, needed um, in the not too distant future. And um, I, do, do any of the board members have any questions about the budget or the fund? Hearing none, um, I'll move on to the next item, um, which is licensing update. And um, I'm going to turn this over to our uh, licensing and administration uh, manager, Dixie Van Allen. Dixie, are you on the line? 
I am. Thank you. Um, so I have the full fiscal year 1920 available in the statistics provided in your packet. Um, so you can see an overall overall view of where we're standing right now. Um, as far as our um, licensed population of chiropractors, we are down about 150, which is following along um, the same trajectory that we have in uh, years prior. Um, so it's a slow decrease, but nevertheless, it is a decrease in um, licensees. Um, as far as new chiropractic licenses issued, there was a drop off in, in the number of licenses issued in April and May. And that was primarily due to um, our testing sites being closed. Um, so we weren't able to fulfill that. They have since reopened and we are back in business. So you see in June, there was a, um, a large jump in the number of licenses issued. Um, let's see, the, um, the number of satellites has also decreased a little bit. And um, I know that that is, there are a lot of chiropractors that say they just haven't been working, have had to close their offices um, due to COVID. So um, people aren't applying for um, new satellites right now um, as they were in the past. But hopefully if this pandemic um, is resolved or you know, if cases start dropping off, then we will resume our number of satellites and um, satellite offices that we're issuing. Um, so the rest remains relatively stable. And as far as our online renewals go, we are roughly at about 50% of our licensees renewing online, which is um, a significant reduction in workload on our staff. Um, and it's also helpful for the licensees themselves because they are able to get their renewals um, processed in a much more timely manner. Um, so I anticipate that this will increase as time goes by. We've been sending out newsletters and um, flyers in every renewal stating that we now have online renewal. And we've also been posting that on our social media sites um, to educate our licensees. And, um, and I think, you know, in the near future when rest of our applications are available online that, um, that the licensees will follow in the, the new, um, uh, we'll, we'll follow in um, renewing and processing those applications online as well. Um, thank you. Does anybody have any questions regarding the licensing statistics? Hi, I actually um, have a question or comment. Um, thank you, Dixie, for that. Um, I know that we are, it's obvious that the trends are down possibly due to COVID, um, but my, I wanted to find out, um, we pre you previously provided us with um, trends in other specialties, and I believe a couple of meetings ago, we were talking about adding um, physician's assistance to the licensing trends and so for future reports. And I just want to know when um, you, we will, how often will we have those reports that compare the trends to other um, specialties? And um, yeah, that's really it. Dr. McClain, we'll, um, we'll have that at, uh, at the next meeting, at the October meeting, we'll, we'll have some comparisons to share with the board. Great, thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Dixie. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, then we'll move on to our enforcement uh, report, and um, our enforcement manager, Kristen Walker, will um, will brief you on enforcement stats. Good morning. Um, the enforcement statistics table that is in the board meeting materials um, now it covers um, all for the, um, the last fiscal year. Um, as far as trends go, um, you, can, you can see that we've, um, we've closed a number of complaints within this last fiscal year. We actually closed over 800, which is a significant increase from the prior fiscal year. Um, you can see that we did receive um, more complaints than we, did, than we have in the past. It's been trending upwards. So we're, we received 700, 783 in the last fiscal year. Um, and we worked hard to um, move as many along as we could so we were able to keep our number of pending complaints relatively stable. 
Um, you'll see that there's an increase in the number of letters of admonishment that were used in the last fiscal year. That was primarily used as an educational tool to address um, CE violations and other minor violations such as um, missing items and uh, patient records and um, other things that we wanted to um, really educate the licensees and hopefully prevent any future violations. We use that tool. Um, at the last, um, the last time I gave an update, there was a request that I add um, the total fines collected for citation. So um, you'll see a new line item for that. And this last fiscal year, we issued 110 citations. And that number is um, significantly higher than in prior years. And it's mainly due to using citations to address um, the more egregious CE violations. Um, you'll also see that of all the fines that we've assessed, we've, we've been fairly successful and we've collected about 90% of those. Um, and we also have people that are on payment plans. So we're, we've done a pretty good job of collecting those citations. Um, the rest of the data is relatively similar to prior fiscal years. You'll notice that when it comes to disciplinary cases, <clears throat> excuse me, there's um, a slight drop off and it's, it's kind of, it's, there was a trend on, in the last fiscal year, we closed out a lot of um, prior accusation cases. And then in this fiscal year, they're just beginning. So what we're, we're in this period where I expect going forward, um, in this current fiscal year, we're going to see a lot more closures when it comes to disciplinary cases because we had quite a few referrals um, that re just recently occurred within the last few months. So you'll, you should probably expect more um, disciplinary decisions coming your way probably within the next three to six months. Um, and aside from, aside from that, um, that's all I had on that table. Are there any board member questions with that data? Thank you for explaining that, Kristen. There was a notice, this is Dr. Paris, there was a, a noticeable slowdown in disciplinary referrals. And um, so thank you for that explanation. Also, thank you for providing the information, Kristen, on the um, collected versus assessed fines. I asked for that previously, and that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Sure, you're welcome. Okay, um, hearing no questions or further questions on that table, um, the uh, materials also include um, two charts um, comparing the types of complaints that we received and the accusations that are filed. So I'm going to briefly go through those. Um, as far as this last fiscal year, the complaints received, we had 783. Um, it's the, as far as the trend goes, we're seeing similar types of complaints that we've been getting within the last few fiscal years. Um, Aside from failed CE audits, which made up a little under half of our workload, um, we have complaints that are presenting with general unprofessional conduct, um, improper advertising, cases that we open as a result of a licensee arrest or conviction, um, complaints that present with allegations of fraud, and then also complaints um, with allegations of uh, negligence or incompetence on the part of a licensee. Um, so it's very similar with what we've had in prior fiscal years. And then as far as the accusations that were filed, the number of, that were filed was down in this last fiscal year compared to the prior years. And like I said, we're just in this transition period where we were closing out older cases and the, new, the newest cases, there haven't been accusations filed yet. So we have a little bit less data, but it's still similar with what we see in prior fiscal years. Um, the primary um, violations resulting in, allegation, in accusations against our licensees remain um, gross negligence, sexual misconduct, criminal convictions, and um, serious record keeping and billing issues, um, general allegations of fraud. Are there any questions on those? I just want to say thanks for continuing to do this. It's very descriptive and helpful and um, kind of having us, you know, wrap our mind around what's actually going on out in the field and, and in enforcement. And so it looks like that's it. And then I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Marcus to provide an update on our IT program. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just have a brief, a couple of brief updates. Um, we've continued to push forward with attempting to modernize our systems. Um, late last year, 
we were able to actually begin accepting online payment for renewal and satellites. Um, and as we continue to move forward on our larger IT overhaul and new system integration, um, our first release um, to the public will be at the end of August and the expected functionality, the acceptance of the initial license application. So app, new applicants will be able to submit and go through a completely paperless process um, on our side where they can submit their application online and they will receive feedback um, and correspondence from the board using an online portal where they'll log in and have access to all the information on a dashboard, similar to what you see on other products or things that you use in your personal life. And that's something that um, I, along with um, a couple of folks on the staff, have been working on with DCA OIS um, and our um, IT vendor. And that um, complete project you know, will probably last another 12 to 18 months. But it's something that we've been working on and uh, making some significant progress towards modernizing um, a lot of the board's functionality. Um, and then also, um, as we transition to the new system, um, we're taking an iter iterative approach. And so we're not just gonna be taking um, full things away from the board such as, as the functionality. So um, also with the August release, we'll be able to um, complete license renewals using the new system. So licensees will go onto the online portal, they'll enter in their information and get hooked up into the system, and they'll send and receive correspondence from the board and be notified of their upcoming renewals using the system dashboard. And so that'll be really helpful um, as the licensees will have access to a lot more information um, than they've had in the past, and they can, again, complete these transactions online. So I think um, this would be helpful, and we'll continue to push the board forward and its ability to transact things online, especially in light of COVID, you know, and, you know, any possible, you know, um, pandemics or disruptions to, you know, services going forward. Um, it's important and vital that as a program um, and for the protection of the public that we're able to um, transact and do more of these functionalities um, online. Um, I think as far as and then there's some a couple of other things that um, we've done since the last time we've discussed this, both Chris and Dixie and I, we've um, been trained on DCA's reporting system called Qbert. Um, we're not completely well versed in the system, but I think that at some point in the future, we'll be able to um, provide the board with more robust statistics and data. Um, and so that'll be pretty helpful. We'll be able to modernize and, and create some pretty unique and I think informative reports um, that'll be helpful to explaining maybe some of the issues that we're not seeing now. And so again, as we get trained up and have a little bit more time to devote to data and reporting out to the board, we'll be able to use some of the functionality that the department's created to provide you guys with some more um, relevant and prescient data. Um, and besides that, I think that um, we've continued to move forward. I think as Robert discussed earlier, um, most of the staff has been teleworking, and so we've just kind of had to turn our focus and realize efficiencies and try to figure out the best ways for the office to continue to function um, in an age where most of the staff will be working from home. So fortunately, um, with the support of the department, we've had the ability to um, pretty quickly allow most of our staff to continue to work and to provide the services that we normally would be providing into the office, we've been able to allow them to continue their work using their own equipment at home, um, using you know some technology features that we didn't know were available. Um, and so I think that um, even though it's been a challenge in this new era, I think that with the support of the department and Robert's leadership, we've been able to effectively transition many of the things that we've done in the past via paper We've tried to find the most efficient ways for staff to continue to do those things online. And so I think that as far as our IT, we're doing the best that we can, you know, to move forward. And um, if the board members do have any questions, I uh, would love to answer them.
Thank you, Marcus. Um, if the board members don't have questions, I, I just I just want to um, thank Marcus for uh, for overseeing all of this IT transition. Um, he's quite a bit younger than me and much more technologically savvy, and um, he's really been single-handedly um, coordinating. He's been the liaison with um, with the Department of Consumer Affairs and um, ensuring that this is all going smoothly and um, making me and the board um, look good. So I, I appreciate all the, the work he's doing. And I also want to thank um, all three managers uh, for everything they're doing right now. We're, we're dealing with a lot of transition right now. Um, the whole IT system, not only will we be getting a new system that everybody has to be trained on, but the, uh, but our processes will be changing you know, once we're automated because currently we have uh, virtually, sorry, currently we have, um, I'm sorry, I saw a text and got distracted. Um, uh, virtually no um, automated systems. We do most of our processes manually. You know, the, um, renewals come in in the mail, they have to be um, cashiered and then they have to be entered into the system. And as we advance with technology, that stuff will all be happening online and will eliminate a lot of the, uh, a lot of the work that um, we're having to do here in the office. Just, just the volume of mail that's already gone down with the, um, with the ability to do online renewals is, is amazing. So the, um, the paper that we're um, not wasting is, is really impressive. There's a lot of positive changes that are coming from that, um, these transitions uh, with that. And then, you know, in the midst of this whole IT transition, uh, we had the COVID pandemic and had to transition to um, telework and, and other modifications. And um, the, the staff and the managers have been amazing in um, enrolling with this. It's, it's been challenging, but we're, you know, we're keeping up and I just want to thank uh, everyone for, for their part in this. And I, I believe Mr. Rufino um, just joined us. Um, I don't know if he's, um, if he's connected yet. This is the moderator. I still don't have him showing. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'll I'll help. I'll um, follow up with him, but he'll be joining us shortly. And um, then one last thing: we have um, a 15-minute break, and then we have um, a couple of presentations. Um, the we tried to schedule with because the the presenters are out of state, and so we we tried to give them a specific time. And 11 o'clock is when the first presenter starts. So um, I was thinking we could take our 15-minute break, and then. Um, Dr. Paris, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we can take up agenda item 10 following the break, and uh, which is update on the um, on the waiver we submitted for curriculum, and um, and then hopefully by then we'll be pretty uh, close to 11. This is Dr. Paris. Or is Dr. Rufino on? I I don't think he is. I'll I'll um, I'll communicate with him um, when I'm done here, and then we'll get him online. So, um, this so is Dr. the moderator. Perry, oh. Did you want to take a public comment before the break? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Board Chair Paris, would you like me to open up for public comment? I think Dr. Paris got disconnected. Uh, I am still showing. Yes, let's take public comment. Yeah, so if we could take public comment and and then um, we'll we'll get the two board members back online and um, and then take our break. This is the moderator, and at the direction of the board, I have opened the Q&A feature for public comment. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. I'm sharing the instructions on the screen for reference. 
It is not necessary to identify yourself in order to make a public comment, and I will take comments in the order that they are received. Please note that the Q&A feature is being used only as a means for the members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. Once unmuted, the member of the public may verbally state their comment. I will now pause a moment to give the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. Board Chair, we have not received any public comments. Would you like me to close this feature? Uh, uh, if, it, uh, actually, if David Dr. is not back, then we yeah. can go ahead and close the feature. Um, this is Dion McClain. Yeah, Dr. McClain's the vice chair, so um, until we get David back online, um, um, she'll put. She'll, I'll proceed. Um, So I, I'm sorry. So um, so there were no public comments. And I, I, uh, Dr. McLean, did you say you want to proceed to the break? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I hit the mute again. So yes, um, <laughs> if, since there's no public comment, we can proceed to the next um, item and take a 15 minute break and return back in 15 minutes. And hopefully we'll have all the board members back on by then and we can proceed. Thank this you. is the moderator. We are taking a 15 minute break and we'll resume at 1010. Okay, um, sounds good. So if um, Brittany, if you can um, resume and then Dr. Paris can uh, hold on, hold on. I think I think agenda item 10 is probably a little bit. It's going to require a larger discussion, a longer discussion than it's probably enough time. Um, I think Dr. Edwards will, I think we'll be able to get her on between five, in about five minutes. And so I would say, let's just hold off and do that presentation. If you want Dr. Paris, or I just yeah, want to make no, sure no. we're doing it in order no, that's, that's fine. for you. That's fine. I was just, I was just trying, I thought if we had enough time, but yeah, I'd rather make sure we have enough time for the full discussion. So let, let's just, uh, let's just wait. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Michaela Edwards, I have promoted you to panelists. Can we please do a mic check? Marcus is walking her through it. She couldn't hear you, Brittany. Dr. Edwards, are you able to hear me? This is the moderator. Brittany, I'm, I'm walking her through it right now. So I'm going to get her hooked up on the phone. So just give me a moment. Dr. Edwards, this is the moderator. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can. Fantastic. Board Chair Paris, would you like us to go ahead and proceed? Um, yes, please. Do we have everybody um, back? Is everybody back on? It does appear that we have everybody. I'm still waiting for board member um, Frank Rufino, Rufino to join us, um, as yeah, I have well, not yeah. seen him log in as of yet. Um, yeah, he was having a technical problem. One of the staff was helping him, so he should be on momentarily. Hello, this is Natalie Boyer. When I spoke to him, he implied that it was another 15 to 20 minutes before he'd be able to get on. So I anticipate probably another 10 until we hear from him. Okay, Fantastic. so then we can proceed. 
I will keep an eye out for him. Um, Dr. Edwards, I do ask that when you need the slides progressed forward to please make an indication so we know to advance your slides. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. Okay, one Thank moment you. prior to Dr. Edwards' presentation, I would like to ask um, Executive Officer um, Polio if you'd like to introduce the topic to give a little context to this presentation. Uh, thank you, Marcus. So um, we were, uh, this is a something that came up at our last meeting and in light of um, recent events and um, social unrest and the riots that occurred, um, Dr. McLean wanted to, um, you know, uh, look into this and address this, see what how the board could address the, um, the current events and um, what we could do. And so one of the one of the things we did after um, discussing with Dr. McLean um, her thoughts, um, we invited um, representatives from the profession that are um, involved. Uh, we have um, Dr. Edwards is with the. American Black Chiropractic Association, and so um, it would be very interesting to uh, get her perspective on you know, um, the profession from, you know, because there are very few um, people of color um, in this profession, and, you know, and so to get her perspective on um, what it's like and what changes she believes are necessary. And um, she spent some time um, speaking with Marcus and I, and I thank her very much for her time being here. And then after um, Dr. Edwards, we'll have um, Dr. Foshi, who's with the American Chiropractic Association and their diversity program. So I, uh, this, is, um, this is a good opportunity for the board and for um, you know, people who are listening into this meeting um, to, uh, to get a perspective on uh, the profession from and people are looking at diversity and um, and if there are um, issues or or um, you know hurdles that you know, people of color have to um, address that we may not be aware of um, you know to enter the profession and also if there's barriers to the public to obtaining chiropractic and and so how you know there may be things we as a board can do to uh, to uh, you know address situations that um, are, you know, in unintentional bias or uh, just things that we may not be aware of that we should be. So um, thank you again, and uh, Dr. Edwards, and uh, please proceed. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, to all of those that are on the call, thank you so much for um, lending your ear for a moment and just giving me the opportunity to present on behalf of the American Black Chiropractic Association. So. We appreciate it. Um, I am currently the national president of the association. Uh, I was just elected on June 28th and uh, sworn in on June 28th, I'm sorry, and took over uh, the office on July the 1st. So we are on the move. Everything has been going quite quickly, um, but I am proud to say that I am a 12-year member of the board of directors for the American Black Chiropractic Association. So um, nothing... You know, nothing has been dropped on me that I have not been uh, privy to prior. So just wanted to uh, make sure that um, you all know how to find us before we get started. Um, we are on the Internet, www.abcacairo.com is our website. It's a very action, active and functioning uh, website where we interact with our members. Um, information is there on our leadership, um, on our current and past leadership as well. And then we pretty much have all of our events um, that will be promoted through our, our website. Um, our students go on our website to receive information down, trickle down from uh, the association, from the board of directors. So um, feel free to go out there and take a look and see what we have. It is currently, um, and, and I can say currently just because I've, I've had calls this week on revamp things. We'll, we'll change some things and we're adding some things that I'll get into within my presentation. Um, but you can always find us there. You can always reach out to any of our board members through our leadership uh, page or our contact us page. So feel free uh, to, to peruse the web, our website at will. All right, so we can go on to the next slide. I'll just go briefly into a history of the ABCA. A lot of people may not, you know, understand or know much about the association, 
Um, so let me give just a few details. We were founded in 1981. Dr. Bobby Westbrook, he uh, was a chiropractor who graduated from, um, well, the, the school, I want to say, was St. Louis Chiropractic College when he went, but now it's considered Logan, um, which is also my alma mater. Um, he founded the association in 1981. He had a group of colleagues, and they figured the issue within the profession um, was that they were just not able to get a lot of the information uh, from the chiropractic world to the communities in which they serve. So there was a lot of disparities there. Um, and so they formed the, the association, and we had our very first national convention on the campus of Logan uh, Chiropractic College at the time um, in 1981. We have currently, uh, to date, about 250 members. Our members uh, are inclusive of students that are in DC programs across the nation, as well as doctors um, within all of the uh, 50 states of the United States. So um, we do have a couple of different membership um, types. So our doctors can join on an annual basis, or they can join as a lifetime member. And then our students just have a one-time fee that they are members. They pay one. one uh, they join in their members the entire duration of their time in chiropractic college. So um, just to give a little bit of a perspective there and how um, we fit into this paradigm of the profession uh, of, of even, you know, organizations or associations in the profession. Um, currently, according to the ACA, um, there's about 70,000 chiropractors in, in the nation, roughly about three you know, academic or management roles and won't ever, you know, uh, be a practice or, or practice traditionally in a clinic. So if you think about it in that perspective, I don't have any numbers that will tell you uh, what our membership numbers look like according to any comparisons of just chiropractors in the nation, because no one gives those demographics up, right? We have um, schools that some sometimes, uh, you know, I, and I, I have to believe that schools keep this data um, somewhere, whether it's from that original application to go into the chiropractic uh, program. I don't even recall <laughs> filling out anything. It's been so long. But um, I, I would think that the schools would know if they have, you know, data that they, they could easily pull and publish on the number of minorities versus the number of enrollees at, at their uh, institutions, but they just don't have it packaged to where they all will, will give it out. We've asked quite a bit of times different schools um, to see if we can get this data, and a lot of them don't have it. So uh, we went to the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners, and they don't have it either, or they have it, but I, I think they don't publish it because it's considered personal data from um, you know their their constituents. So we we are working on estimates and guesstimates here. Um, I would be vexed to say if there was about 70,000 chiropractors in the nation and the ABCA has about 250 members, we'll, we're safe to say that we represent less than 1% of the profession. But when you look at things from a demographic uh, standpoint, it, it, it almost doesn't pan out. So that's, that's where we're at with regards to numbers. We are a very small association. Um, and there are probably a number, a good number, or a, a, a good percentage of people that are still chiropractors or students in curricula across the nation that have not affiliated with the ABCA as well, and they, they would fit the bill. They're minorities, they're black, they're Latina, they are, you know, Asian. Um, and then in some instances, in some schools, you see we have members that uh, fit the bill through the whole entire gamut of the uh, umbrella of minority. So. Um, we're small, we're growing. I think a lot of our issues are is that we just didn't have the visibility of the association across the board. So this is where the numbers game becomes something to really think about. But the ABCA's mission, and we published this mission under uh, the leadership of Dr. Winston Carthy's administration, is to integrate and improve outcomes for persons of color entering the profession of doctor of chiropractic. So anyone who wants to support that mission, support doctors of chiropractic that are of color, black, or any type of minority, then they are welcome to join the ABCA. We make sure that we have that out there because a lot of people feel like, you know, there is uh, a strict and stringent requirement to even be affiliated, and that is simply just not true. So again, um, we have nine initiatives. The purpose that our founder and um, his first administration have actually uh, organize the association based upon. Um, I'm not going to go over all of them. They are actually on our website. We do have a mission page on our website. You can feel free to look at them. But as of right now, where the ABCA is at under my leadership, we have three of those initiatives that become the main focal point 
of our being right now, um, and that includes mentorship, leadership, and scholarship. So you can go to the next slide, and I'm going to break down each of those just to kind of explain what's happening with um, the ABCA, our students, and our ideas uh, with regards to what's happening today. So in, in mentorship, we focus the, the, the 250 number that was on my first slide of, of members. Um, the majority, the bulk majority of those members, honestly, are students. So our students are um, pretty much the, the vital force right now of the ABCA. And because our, our, our founder actually founded the association uh, with the idea of supporting the students at, at, at will, because, of course, they will be the future of the profession within, you know, the, the community, so to speak. Um, he basically created a program within our organization that gave a lifeline to the students at these colleges so that they could get, you know, um, firsthand knowledge on information that just isn't filtered through within the curricula on how to treat and best to help the, uh, the patients in our communities nationwide. Um, and so we take mentorship really hard to, to, to its heart because um, there is pretty much a lot that happens within our community that we are not necessarily uh, taught or presented to us as students as focal points. So within our membership, we, we actually have added a new membership category um, to uh, the ABCA membership tier that caters to new doctors uh, that have just graduated. So upon graduation up to five years post-grad, we add them into a new category of membership where they receive exclusive training with, with contracted affiliates, which are all affiliates of the ABCA that include owners that are members of the ABCA. So these are your organizations like Evoke Chiropractic Coaching, um, Kairos uh, Culture Training, um, and then, you know, we do have affiliates with Integrity. And so we got people that will uh, train and help work with our students and new doctors to basically uh, prepare them for specifics within our communities that they may not be privy to in sitting in classrooms and depending on especially what school they have graduated from. So that's one of the main points and purposes of our mentorship. We try to combat some of those questions early on so there are no issues or no hiccups once, you know, the, the, our students graduate and become doctors and start to practice. You can go on to the next slide, and I'll talk a bit about our leadership, what we've done with leadership. Leaders has really ramped up in the last, I will say, man, maybe three years or so, three or four years. We've really tried to figure out how we could present leaders for um, the profession that are be to actually represent on main stages, um, in front of classrooms, on board of boards of directors, on state boards on national association boards, how we could do that and make sure that we are well represented so that, number one, uh, the opportunities are presented, and number two, when we do show up on those large stages that people recognize and understand and then maybe others will feel comfortable even inviting or also, um, you know, recognizing what, that we're there um, and there is a need to, you know, in, increase it in those numbers. So. With that, we actually um, have begun making sure or vetting all of our members that are actual speakers so that we could sponsor our own speakers or um, get into the game of uh, CEUs where you are certifying certain individuals to, to, to represent the ABCA and speak um, and, and, you know, contribute to continuing education credit. Um, a long-term goal that I was just speaking with someone about yesterday um, was in hopes that we can get all 50 states to add, you know, a diversity uh, to our credit that will be required to each state. I don't know. We're, we, those are uh, preliminary, con you know, conversations, but just thinking out loud, um, the idea would be that we would actually um, be the gamut of providing such speakers and, and be the ones to do that um, and send, send speakers out when, you know, they are needed. So we're collecting uh, data at this moment and we're revamping our website so that we can actually promote our speakers. And if people, um, organizations, companies, schools need a speaker, then they know the first thing that they could do is go to our website and see who is available and book them directly through the ABCA. So that's one thing that we're working on. Another thing that we uh, brainstormed about was the fact that, you know, we don't have many African American, Black, or minority teachers um, at the schools. And we don't have the same with regards to faculty and, you know, executive offices are concerned. 
So the ABCA has, um, we're, we're ramping up also um, in the next 30 to 60 days, we'll have a segment on our website where you can actually, um, you know, post your jobs for positions uh, within the profession um, for in our members only section to ensure that a very, you know, distinctive group of people receives the job posting or, or has access to it. Um, so we're working on that, and we also are working on, you know, working with the schools on on some research. So I will talk a little bit more in depth about um, the research in a second, but I wanted to, you know, put that out there as well. One of the line items within our mission is a research as well, and so the ABCA has not taken part in active research um, to, to this point, to my understanding, and so that's something we're also looking to go into. You want to go to the next slide. I'll go briefly over um, scholarship, of course, as I said before, was one of the main points that Dr. Bobby Westbrook was um, very adamant about in founding the ABCA. He wanted to make sure that our students were uh, at least supported in some way, and so fundraising efforts are always underway to, to raise funds for our annual scholarships. We currently give away um, anywhere from three to five scholarships a year. Um, and these scholarships are to our student members only, um, and the uh, award amounts vary according to our fundraising efforts. But uh, one of my main goals and initiatives that I ran for president under is to officially establish a Harvey Lillard endowment so that we can fully fund a, a true fund um, that, you know, lives on and is a, a continual uh, contribution, contribution to our bottom line of scholarships. Uh, scholarship, you know, awards that we give out each year. So we are going to undertake the initial phase of the endowment and raise $25,000 to fully fund um, our first scholarship in 2021. So as soon as we're able to start rolling that out, that will be something that we'll publicize and make sure um, we, you know, get as much help as we can to, to reach our goal. But that's one of the main things that I also ran on. You can go on to the next slide. And so basically what the ABCA has um, literally been rolled into, kind of like, you know, the bowling ball just coming down the aisle. Um, we were rolled into, of course, just a time in history where our nation has, you know, uh, been shaken with civil unrest. And so with the death of George Floyd in, in Minnesota, we completely uh, were forced to uh, take an active approach to helping our students maneuver through this entire time frame, not only you know COVID with the pandemic, but also then with the civil unrest that happened. So a lot of our students reached out, and so much was flooded into the ABCA as far as what has been going on. I mean, most people then at, at this point feel like they have actually, you know, um, found a way or found a reason to, uh, you know, open up and tell their stories, and so. Once we started to collect data, it became obvious that we had missed so much. And when I say missed so much, it's just that we have so many students nationwide and, and we're a volunteer board of, of anywhere from 13 to 20 people in any given administration. Um, you know, it, it, sometimes it does get broken and you may have a regional director that it just isn't connecting with the students in his or her region or even one particular state of her his or her region. And so they may miss what is going on at these schools. But we learned that a lot of disparaging, disparaging things were actually, you know, happening and the students were literally going through a lot. And so uh, we decided it, there was, it, it was a, a perfect time to actually start the DNI conversation. So for as far as diversity and inclusion are concerned, what I did was I wrote a letter, a call of a call to action to each um, uh, school president in the nation that basically introduced them to the ABCA and our initiatives and also discussed um, the idea of hearing more about and learning more about each school's plight when it comes down to diversity and inclusion. Not all schools have uh, a DNI representative or a committee, even less knowing a department. But while other schools are so far ahead of the curve with this situation that they have all three, um, and they're you know working well into making goals that are already included within the school's goals or mission statement that they publish. So 
what we wanted to do is to invite the presidents to take a look at that, those DNI um, departments, committees, uh, individuals, and do, an, do a self-check, do an audit, right, of each of the school's um, stance on the, on the topic so that they can establish and review the goals of those departments, making sure that they're on task, make sure that if the goals are not being made, then they need to change the plan so that they can execute it in order to achieve those goals. Um, we also encourage them to include the ABCA representative somewhere along the line it, within their uh, committees or departments, however it may be, whether that looks like there's a representative on the uh, committee or it looks like there's a liaison or, you know, a, a student that has someone uh, active within the, de the department as maybe their faculty advisor um, within the club on campus. However that looks, we like to have, uh, you know, at least some type of input so that as a representative of a minority group on the campus, they have a voice. Um, and then we suggested that each of the schools added diversity training to their staff or in some schools may opt to do it with students as well, which we encourage. Um, but we're working with uh, a couple of schools that have done this in the past that actually have lists that are pre-created uh, pre that we could actually make suggestions to schools to use. So um, that was one of our suggestions is to add this diversity training for staff or staff and students. And then we have um, a call to action for each school to work with the ABCA um, and partner with us uh, within their recruiting requirements and, um, you know, their admissions team. So what we'd like to do there, the ABCA wants to become a staple of, um, you know, information, I guess you can, can, can say that we want to be able to help these schools in going into historically black colleges and universities. Um, into, urban, into the urban core of any major city uh, within the United States where recruitment is being done for students to come into or enter the, the you know, the, the doctorate of chiropractic programs at these schools. Um, currently at this time, most of the schools have a recruiter, recruiter or an active admissions department, um, but they are not recruiting in the spots that would likely get them in front of the, mo the most or the the highest number of the um, minority students that are, you know, would be qualified to make a decision for DC school. Um, and so we want to work with the schools in helping them to get into uh, these places. Um, if the person or if their departments do not literally house someone that's a person of color or a minority, um, it may be a, a good look if they don't have a student on campus that they could employ and say, you know, we're going to, you know, send you to this convention over here just to represent the school. Um, the ABCA can always step in and try and, and fill that void as well. So that's kind of a goal um, when it comes down to the diversity and inclusion piece. Um, and at that point in time, at this point in time, I am collecting data from, you know, the presidents of the schools, um, from the DNI departments that are actually already established. And so we've had a very positive response to this thing. There are some that have not responded at all, um, but I do have a follow-up waiting. And so once I send out the follow-up in January of 2021, the ABCA is planning on doing uh, a virtual, you know, summit slash, I don't know, town hall. I'm not sure what we'll call it yet, but we'll have those same presidents. Everybody who received the call to action will be invited on this call so that we can kind of get a good understanding and hear what everyone share, what everyone's thoughts are, and have a conversation as well as see what um, things are looking like from a DNI perspective within the educational realm of the profession. So, hope, hoping for uh, a very positive experience there, um, and that, which brings me into the very last piece. You can go on to the next slide, please, which is the research piece. So, um, uh, the initiative that I have laid out were pretty pretty dynamic, I will admit, because my plans to, to take in, you know, take on all of the um, responsibilities that, you know, will end up reaching a goal are, are kind of uh, strenuous. But the research piece, I, I feel, is so necessary, um, and it was born out of the idea of, you know, we're in a pandemic, and the profession was up in arms about just simply using um, simply using the uh, to get an adjustment and it will boost your immune immunity or your immune system. Um, so much came out of that conversation because we just didn't have a lot of concrete or top-notch research that was out there. And I know our board of directors had a conversation 
probably three times about that because we were like, we need to put something out there and we need to make a statement and blah, 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 according to the pandemic. Um, but we struggled. We struggled with finding, you know, some research that we really wanted to use and put forth there. And so I thought, okay, so there's a problem with the re resolution. And so we, we thought to get into the research idea. Um, and so now I am also a CRA and I'm, you know, working on uh, clinical research studies within oncology uh, at this time. But I have seen, you know, I've seen manuals and protocols. So for me, it's like, oh, well, we could just take a lot of this stuff and kind of turn it into some chiropractic things and write our own study. We're currently uh, in talks, and I say this, you know, quite freely because um, literally the conversation happened two days ago, and this is the first time I'm speaking of it publicly, but I want to make sure that it's understood what we're going to. So <laughs> when you hear about it, you say that's what they were referring to. Um, we're working with, uh, with a, a third party that basically looks to do the very first uh, research study uh, that we want to promote, which will be the collection of demographics among diverse clinics across the nation. So the idea is, is not necessarily to come up with tangible, um, uh, a tangible abstract uh, to find a problem. The purpose is to collect data to find out if the schools are teaching adequate, um, I guess, adequate ideologies when it comes down to, you know, um, issues within certain communities or, or within a certain demographic of people um, so that our doctors within this diverse group of people or clinics are actually qualified to treat the people, people's needs within their community. So we're going to send out a, third, uh, a series of surveys that will include doctors and patients that will agree to, you know, answer four of the simple questions or five simple questions post, you know, their chiropractic treat. Um, and basically what we're going to look for is to is to see what most people need within these diverse clinics. What, what, are, what are the patients coming in for? Um, because we feel as if there is a lot that has to happen within our community when a patient walks through the door, right? Um, but it's not necessarily what we learn sitting in class. It's just there's some things that just are not, um, you know, are not the same. I mean, it, 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 there's no other there's no other way to put it. Um, so we want to make sure that we get this information, and so the schools then could use the information to determine again, are, are, is our curricula on point? If the people are saying that they are seeing more, um, you know, uh, injuries, I don't know, it, it's something simple, more injuries with, uh, you know, high arches, because that's one thing within the African-American community, uh, you know, our, our feet. So it, it maybe the curriculum needs to be reviewed to make sure that it is inclusive of, you know, that fact or that type of treatment um, that, that would be necessary for that type of patient. Um, and then also, within the profession, it could be utilized uh, as far as, um, you know, where people are actually seated, right? So if you have, um, you know, a school like Texas Chiropractic College, or let's, let's use Sherman, because Sherman is kind of, I, I don't want to say isolated, but it's a little ways from the next major, major city. Um, you have to take a look at what curricula is offered, off, offered within the state. Um, with regards to what is taught in that state. And so then you go back and you, you take that to board, national board exams, they want to make sure that they're questioning certain things, and then your state, your, your prudence exams, make sure that those things. So a lot of the data we want to utilize from this research study to further, um, you know, give us a peek into what is the next thing we need to try and figure out from a diverse standpoint, how we could better help our, our patients and our communities in those, in those areas. Um, so there's a lot of things that are, that's on the horizon for us, but I mean, that's completely, you know, that's completely what we're, that, that's an overview of what it is that we're looking at. Um, and so you can go to the next slide, and this is the last slide, I believe. It will be the next, the next, the last slide. So um, what, what a lot of the questions, the main question I get is how can we help and what can we do? So, um, you know, the first thing, of course, I would always suggest to, to consider ABCA speakers for any of your engagements. If you have, um, if you're putting on any CE, you know, uh, summits or uh, 
conventions or conferences, always, uh, you know, consider using ABCA speakers for that. That will definitely increase your uh, diversity uh, within your paneling um, of, of how you are actually promoting your event. Um, and, and, of course, upon promoting an event with um, more diverse uh, speakers, you will probably or likely, uh, you know, pull in a more diverse crowd that will participate. So always consider ABCA speakers. And again, coming in the next 30 to 60 days, you'll be able to, you know, go simply to our website and make a reference or a referral or a request um, for such. We also suggest that you don't donate to our Harvey Miller Scholarship Endowment or even create an, uh, create an actual scholarship for yourself um, within your, we currently have, uh, I think, two. I know for a fact Ohio has, um, the Ohio State Chiropractic Board has actually created a scholarship that's specific. They man the scholarship, but they come to us and ask us, do we have students within their state that we can filter to so that they can apply? Um, so that's always an option. You know, the ABCA loves to hear things like that, and we make sure that all of our students nationwide get to hear about such opportunities. So we definitely would suggest that every state can create its own scholarship if they like, and the ABCA would definitely promote it, or they can also donate to our Harvey Lillard Scholarship Endowment or any of our scholarships for that matter. Um, and then we can, we can most definitely always say that state associations, schools, any other, you know, organizations within the profession always try to, you know, aid in the funding for research studies uh, that come up within diversity um, because, of course, there really just aren't any right now in the profession. Um, if we are able to get at least this one off, off you know, um, the ground, I, I can foresee about four others coming right behind it. Um, but of course, we'll need funding for it, so we'll have to raise, raise funds for that. Um, and that's always something that you, you as a state board would be able to uh, contribute to. And then, um, lastly, I have on the list, we are going to be in Hayward at LifeWest um, in June of 2021. So we are actually uh, hosting our national convention there. It was planned to be there this past June. Of course, we had to cancel it because of the, you know, COVID uh, pandemic. Um, but we have just literally turned everything into a 2021 convention there. And just because of the change in times that's happening right now, I had a conversation with Dr. Oberstein, which is the president of LifeWatch yesterday, and it was a great conversation. Um, and so we had some some uh, ideas that we put on the table, and we may kind of change the format of things just because of the time. So we may have to, you know, we, we may bring in outside organizations and uh, just have some type of a panel and open up the uh, lines of communication within the community there um, while the ABCA is, you know, on the ground. So um, we it definitely invite you all out to join us there. Um, I don't know exactly how it, would, how it would look, whether we would invite you to our, of course, we would probably invite you all to our banquet, but we want to include um, you all as well, you know, in general throughout the weekend's agenda. So forthcoming information on that will be posted on our website. Um, and so we definitely invite you there. And then just look for the ABCA's future events to support um, at any time. Again, everything is normally posted on our website. So just, you know, take note of our website and you go to the next page. Um, I think it's there. Okay, yeah, our website is there, and then you can catch us on any of the social media platforms. There are all of our social media um, um, handles, and if you have ever have any questions, I can always be reached within the leadership um, page of our website. Uh, you can email me there, president at abcacairo.com, but if all of sales info at abcacairo.com comes straight to my phone, and as well as Dr. Brandy Childress, which is my vice president, and we are always willing to answer and eager to work with you all. So um, I will turn the floor back over. If there are any questions, I'll, I'll be glad to answer. Otherwise, thank you so much. Well, that's, thank you, Dr. Edwards. That was fantastic. And uh, ABCA sure is busy. Um, that, that was a really wonderful, informative uh, presentation. Um, you know, it's it's really hopeful and inspiring to see the ABC doing the work they do. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, you've, you've recently connected with the, the Clinical Compass in a more meaningful way. And I, I hope, yeah, and, uh, and I think that's fantastic. And I hope that that connection, you know, bears some fruit in, you know, your, your research goals and the projects that 
that you described and, and in, you know, helping us all overcome these disparities in healthcare. Um, yeah. You know, as the board chair, I, I, I really would, um, I really would like to, like to, you know, request that the, the board and the staff, you know, that we start to work with sharing some of the research and the information that you presented and, the, and, and, and hopefully more as you move along um, with our licensees and our stakeholders. And, uh, and so I, I just want to thank you for that very much. Um, that was really yeah, thank inspiring. You. Thank you. And I, I'd like to open the floor for discussion for uh, any any other board members. I'd like this to make is a the comment. moderator. Um, I'm sorry. I was just going to say. I didn't... No, that's okay. It just looks like Frank Rafino has a question with his hand raised. Okay, you want to go ahead, Frank, and then I'll make my comments after that. Thank you, Dion. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, um, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I um, just joined, um, and sorry for being late, but I had another commitment. Uh, but I want to begin by echoing the um, comments already made by uh, our chair uh, to say thank you, Dr. Edwards, uh, for the tremendous uh, work that the organization, that your organization is doing and for raising um, awareness on this very, very timely subject. I enjoyed the presentation, so I'm so glad that I did not miss your presentation. In fact, I come in, I come on right exactly when you were introduced. So I want you to know I did not miss a single word and I was paying very much. By the way, the ACA blogs, I believe it's of 7-9-2020 and um, and I know I, 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 and forgive me, but let me indulge in reading two of your statements, which I think are very important and we cannot say it enough. We cannot hear it enough. And so I'm gonna quote <clears throat> um, the first one uh, towards the middle of your statement. Uh, you say that, and I think that's important to recognize that doctor, quote, doctors of chiropractic recognize that to elevate the health and wellness of communities, Racism and its resulting inequities must be addressed. ACA and its members are up to that task. I hope uh, that what I want, that that is so true and it's so important. And I hope that we all are up to this task. This is not a singularly uh, task of the ACA or other uh, minority groups, but this is a call, and we all should be recognizing and be up to that particular task. And, uh, and then the other thing that I wanna uh, quickly um, read as well in the, your, in the opening, this is that the events, quote, surrounding Mr. Floyd's death in Minneapolis, force us to publicly face the harsh reality that minority groups are still burdened by racism and oppression. And again, yeah. unquote, uh, it's important to repeat, to recognize, and to deal with, and to be add on. So, with that said, um, you answer my question some, you know, in many ways. But I still want to uh, to ask it, you know, as you very well said in your blog, uh, many, many, the world, many, many have spoken out since the death of George Floyd, and everyone has declared in in so much in in so many terms. Not everyone, but we hope that everyone would declare that they want to work to stop racism, period. Mm -hmm. You know, they, everyone. And so the question is, you know, how do we promote diversity? And like I said, you have addressed it. How do we focus on this concept of inclusion? How do we held accountable our boards, our organizations? And how do we measure, you know, uh, and how we make progress? How do we measure the progress? Uh, it's uh, it, it's it's worth uh, it's worth uh, to note on it. And lastly, uh, as far as your uh, conference in um, next year, I hope that our board uh, will. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be on the board or not next year, but but I hope that our board will make an effort to attend, to make our presence known, and to support 
your organization and all the other organization out there to the extent that it's possible and and uh, that we can. Thank you again, Ms. Uh, Dr. Edwards. I appreciate your uh, presentation very much. Thank you so much for those comments. I appreciate that. I think I think what you're referring to as far as the blog is the ACA blog that we backed the statement for. And so I just wanted to make sure I, I, I cleared that up because the ABCA doesn't necessarily have a blog, but we have contributed to quite a few statements that were made throughout the profession. We were contacted by everyone, <laughs> not necessarily just, you know, schools, but even organizations that wanted to make sure that they were correct in their statements. And so a lot of them backed off, piggybacked off of what the ABCA at the time, Dr. Uh, Briscoe, Quentin Briscoe, our outgoing uh, president, um, had, you know, uh, together with our board written a letter. And so a lot of what you see resounded on those blogs that the ACA wrote are resounding of what, you know, the ABCA put out. So again, I, I, I cannot stress enough how, um, how grateful we are. It, it, it's almost like the, the chaos that turns into bliss, right? You, you have, you know, the cold that undergoes the pressure that ends up becoming a diamond, you know? So we are at the phase of the pressure is <laughs> hitting us. And I'm looking forward to coming out shining on the other side to where, you know, I told my, my board the other day, you know, a, a really long-term goal for the ABCA for me. I mean, I, I pray that it's in my lifetime that it happens. I'm not sure if it will, um, but I pray that it does. Uh, I would like for there to be a United States uh, with a medical or a healthcare uh, system that has no need for an organization such as the ABCA. That's a very big statement. If you, if you really sit and ponder on it for a while, I just told you in my presentation of why the ABCA was formed. Um, I would like for there to not be a need for the ABCA anymore. That's really my goal. <laughs> so um, in order to do that, like, like you said, you know, we literally need to start from the educational standpoint um, and then strengthen the profession internally with people who have that uh, exposure uh, to, you know, curriculum and workload that pretty much promotes the ever-changing multi- um cultural world that we are living in and going towards so um again thank you and i look to, look forward to seeing you at our uh national convention next year as well absolutely very noble goal uh, dr edwards and i i agree with you i'm not sure if we're gonna see her in our lifetime but nothing can happen and unless we unless see I it and unless we start so uh, mm -hmm. Kudos to you and your organization to get this, you know, and all of us to get a start. Do our best that we can. By the way, I am not a doctor or chiropractic. I, I'm oh. one. I, I represent. I'm a public member on the board. So, oh, okay. um, so much more. But I, and that's part of the reason why I'm also racing because this is just beyond just healthcare and and uh, mm -hmm. every. This, this is a universal issue that mm -hmm. we have been dealing with and we will continue to deal with uh you know regardless of your profession yes i agree thank you thank you thank you mr chair mr Rafino, thank you so much for those comments um really appreciate that um i'd like to uh continue to open it up for further discussion from any of the board members so it's Dion McLean, and um, I'd like to make some comments. Um, I'm so very happy to call to action by the ABCA and the items that Dr. Edwards has brought forth today. There has been a lack of recruitment and retention and DEI throughout the profession and especially throughout the schools. And I, I think it's a little, it's sad and a bit shameful that we still don't have the demographic that we have sought out since I, have, I was back in school. And I encourage the schools, and I hope that someone from the schools are present today, to cooperate and assist in us, us, meaning the ABCA and all the members, former, past, and present, to assist us in acquiring this information. Um, I ask that the ACA Diversity Committee work with the ABCA and the NBCE in finding ways to acquire this information because navigating the chiropractic profession and business has unique challenges for and is very nuanced for people of color. But also, there's a unique perspective that's brought forth 
by those. And having these, this, these programs, especially the mentors or access to persons who have done the work can be very helpful, helpful for students as well as doctors at large. But also, as Dr. Edwards has said, um, to assist in improving diversity and equity in the profession. I think that it's very necessary to have these demographics because this information will help the organization reach out to more um, doctors who have these unique perspectives. I also want to encourage the ABCA. I know we have a regional representative as well that um, they attend our meetings and vice versa. Um, Dr. Edwards, when available, um, so that we can continue these conversations because uh, I know that the, this, is, this needs to just be the beginning. It can't, it can't end with one diversity training, one conversation. Mm -hmm. this, this has to begin the work. And mm -hmm. let's, let's get to the work at hand. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. It's so good to hear your voice. I haven't heard your voice since you were on the board of the ABCA as our Western I Regional know. Director. <laughs> I was good to hear your voice and hear you doing well. Thank you so much for the support and, and being uh, integral, I believe, in, in getting me on this call. And, and you are absolutely correct. This is the beginning. We cannot create any leaders, any future leaders within our organization that does not have the same zest and zeal for the goal at hand. So I, I have taken it personally um, and made it my responsibility to do the part to ensure that the leaders of the ABCA keeps up with these initiatives so that we are normalizing these new focus points, right? We are normalizing uh, people of color, any minority on the, on the main stage, um, in the classrooms, on the boards of directors, uh, at the seminars, it's the CEU credit, uh, you know, uh, events. We want to normalize it. And the only way that we can normalize it is to keep it moving. So it has to be something that is forthcoming for, for the long haul. Um, and we're committed to, to churning out leaders internally from the association standpoint with, to have those goals in mind when they take leadership. So I think, I think we are good on that front. Um, it just, seems like the time was right now. The, the, the issues at hand could not uh, keep us set, seated for much longer. So the ball is rolling and we are here. Um, it, may, it may be a little, you know, bumpy at first because, of, of course, we haven't had to focus this, um, you know, deep within the, the topic over the last, I can say, 12 years I've been on the board. So it's kind of like, you know, we have all of the other goals that we were working on before coronavirus hit and before, you know, this incident with our uh, nation pretty much got, you know, way too far ahead of us. Um, and so, yes, this is the beginning. We plan to stay in the long haul, which is why we are hoping to create some type of summit or some type of, we want to kind of be the gold standard when it comes down to diversity within the profession. And so a lot of... Um, you know, conversations that were uh, happening uh, over the last couple of weeks were about long term and it, what did that look like? And so at some point, it's either we revamp our national convention and add a, a, a piece to some type of diversity summit or we do a diversity summit in addition to. I mean, those are things that we are looking at doing. Um, and so hopefully this will be something that is always in the forefront of an agenda towards within our profession. So hopefully we can do that. and and become the beacon within the profession. So I still, I appreciate your, your support. And um, we definitely, we, we have uh, the newly named Dr. Uh, Daryl Blackburn. I couldn't get the first name. Daryl Blackburn is our Western Regional Director now. I appointed him last, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, I believe he's out of Arizona. And, but uh, I think I will most definitely would send him the invitation and if he would, be so kind to, you know, put side, time aside to, to join your board, um, you know, calls to kind of keep you guys updated on what it is the ABCA is doing. We have no problem with that. We actually would love that, um, uh, especially with the, the next convention going to be right there in your state. I mean, he may come out with some information that will help us to kind of, you know, make sure that we are reaching a certain, you know, group within uh, the state when we invite people out to our convention. So I think that's a great idea, and I'll be sure to 
pass that information on. So thank you so much, Dr. McClain. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Dr. McLean. Um, I'd like to leave it open for um, any anyone else on the board. Any further discussion? This is Church Juazlino. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. I'd just like to echo uh, all the comments uh, that all of our other board members said, and uh, you know, thank you for doing such great work. Uh, you're certainly a leader, and we're lucky to have you. So keep pushing forward, and hopefully, you're going to be able to make a huge impact on uh, such a timely topic. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support. I'm also happy to hear that you're working with Dr. Oberstein. As you know, he's going to be, uh, or he is a huge, huge uh, friendly asset in this regard. Mm -hmm. Sir, I still have you? Yes, you're good now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you. I, I enjoy working with Dr. Oberstein. He's so lively. <laughs> and uh, our conversation is so funny because we both are so excited to share. We're like talking over each other and then we're stopping and looking like, what did you say? So we have a lot of ideas we bounced off of him. I look forward to working with him at LifeWest. Thank you, Dr. Azzolino. Um, and let me let me continue to leave it open to see if there's any further discussion. Um, this is Marcus. Um, before we move on, I don't want to necessarily move us backwards, but I just wanted to allow um, Dr. Elbers to illuminate one of the things that she discussed with us on the call. Um, if we have a little bit of time for that, Dr. Pears. A absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Edwards, um, I'd just like to, one of the things that I found really fascinating about the work that you all do, um, especially around your um, convention programming, is kind of the mentorship work you do with students and going out into the community. Um, if you have a couple more moments, can you kind of explain and share what you expressed to both Robert and I on the call around that programming that you do, the wraparound services that you guys provide at your convention and the communities that you go into? Yes. So um, as far as our mentoring program is concerned, the students that are members of the ABCA will actually, um, they, they do, and it's not a requirement within the ABCA, but most of our students is written within our bylaws that they need to have a com community impact. The ABCA also has an initiative called the Community um, Outreach Project. And this is where we basically send our students to be mentors in this community. That's a different, a different program. Um, but within that program, we are visible and we actually bring youth within a community that's surrounding probably a school that they go to um, with information on the program, right? So that these students in the urban core actually are exposed to chiropractic sometimes for the first time and have a representative in front of them that it looks like them. So that's one part of our mentoring from a student's perspective when they go into community. But as far as our mentorship program from a membership perspective, the ABCA offers this strictly to our student members and, and new doctor members to where we put them with um, companies within the nation that is, is, is created to actually train or uh, cultivate or to mentor uh, young minority chiropractors in order to be the best that they can within their communities or demographic of patients that they see. So, for example, um, we have, um, and I'm just going to use this this one just because I know they're confirmed and I, it's already public knowledge. Evoke Chiropractic Coaching is a company that is uh, owned by three um, black chiropractors, all, all Logan alum. They're, they're they're not my classmates, they're a little older than I, except one of them I did sit in class with in Logan. And the whole point in, in Evoke is to coach, um, you know, chiropractors uh, on different aspects of the philosophy side of, of the profession. Um, and so because they are three black males that are in active, active practice within the urban cores of St. Louis and Chicago, um, they pretty much give a lot of detail to our students and the doctors on, on truly what the is that they see on a day-to-day -day basis, not necessarily just going through an appointment, you know, a new patient. 
see your report of findings and then, you know, sell a package and adjust, right? They go through the whole idea of, you know, truly what, what people may be thinking. They go through the mental aspect of the patient. Um, a lot of times repro deprogramming and reprogramming one's idea of what chiropractic is because unfortunately within our communities, a lot of our people, a lot of our patients that if, if we get them through the door, it's a lot of apprehension involved because they've heard a whole horror story or they've never heard a story of chiropractic at all, right? So we have to go through the deprogram and reprogram phase and, and evoke kind of touches on these subjects and kind of helps aid into uh, a smooth transition from student to doctor, like you don't have the student outpatient, you're not going through literal literal scripts, although you will go through a script when you're dealing with the patient in the community it, it, within the urban core. It may not sound anything like the script that you're being trained to, to, to give while you're in school, and that's okay, but that's where you, where you have those conversations, right? So our mentorship program there um, would allow our new doctors and students to train under these doctors and to Go, be a part of their, you know, talks and seminars and whatnot, and they go and shadow them as well so that they can get a hands-on idea of what's happening. Um, and then the other two organizations are a little different than Evoke. Uh, Kairos Training is also, Culture Training is owned by, or part owned by um, one of our lifetime members, Dr. Um, he's a LifeWest graduate, um, uh, Dr. Brett Jones. He actually is, is really big on, uh, you know, Almost, I, I want to. I know the word is probably wrong, but I want to say a metaphysical aspect. But he's awesome when it comes down to understanding holistically um, the mind, the body, the soul. When it comes down to treating a patient, and so a lot of what culture, uh, Kairos Ky culture training teaches is it goes through that. It goes through these uh, self, uh, you know, elevating ideology so that you can become the best that you can connect, of course, to the patients that you have in front of you, and, and so. He does that. That's a little bit of a different uh, aspect, but our students get exposed to that as well. And then, um, you know, other uh, entities that we are, uh, we pretty much have a, a direct line to, uh, like, you know, integrity, uh, maximized living. We have a couple of those types of uh, leaders within the ABCA that also expose our students to those options as well um, when it comes down to establishing or setting up uh, a clinic. So from our internal mentorship perspective, we, we like to be, you know, be transparent with our, our students and our new doctors and say, this is really what we're dealing with. I mean, you, we hate just that in school for three years, three or four years, and really, you know, practice in an outpatient clinic as a student intern, um, and you saw what you thought you were going to see, but in reality, it's a little different when you get out and go into the communities, and we wanted to make sure, you know, that our students are exposed to that prior to being thrown out there, because a lot of times it's a you know, it's a, it's a crapshoot. You literally are trying to figure out how, how can you best support your community or your demographic of patients, but you don't know until you get there. Um, so we just kind of beefed up that mentorship uh, uh, aspect of it. Uh, we, we've become very visual on social media these days. Our FAFSA students also have pages that are uh, specific for student members that they can log tap into, and we have um, one of our mentorship uh Past chairman, Dr. Juno Robbins, he does videos, like five-minute talks about, you know, he picks just a topic and he's driving into the clinic. He's sitting there in his office and he just records a video that gives, you know, pretty much drops a lot of jewels of, jewels of knowledge that people can use every day. Um, and so these are the things that we try to make sure we keep our students engaged and, it, you know, excited about practice because, it, I mean, listen, we've been there, we've been in school. We've been overloaded with information. Um, you just kind of want the meat and potatoes. And so we kind of make sure that our students stay linked into the profession in that, in that sense of reality, um, and, you know, and give them a true understanding of what it is they can expect. So um, that's what we are looking for. And I hope I answered your question with that, that aspect because I do understand, and I didn't mention it on my presentation, but the ABCA does have another initiative that we take to heart is that community outreach piece. Um, but that, that falls in line, it falls back in line, right, with the idea that in order for us to recruit more potential chiropractors to join the profession, we still have to go into the minority uh, urban core or, you know, the, the communities to actually let them see that this is an option. So we always take it to heart to go into communities and, and serve communities, whether it's we're, you know, serving at soup kitchens within the area or we create a program within the ABCA's National Convention where we invite 
a group in and we expose them to chiropractic. We give them a tour of school. We let them look in, you know, the cadaver lab. We let them watch as we, you know, have our students palpate and then we let them watch a doctor do an adjustment so that they can actually see what it is. Um, and that's a big part of, you know, starting at the bottom of the problem, right? If you, if you catch a kid when they're small and you expose them to something good, then they'll remember. And so maybe when they become, you know, the college student, they'll say, huh, I want to wonder if I can, you know, go over here and be a chiropractor and it won't be, it'll be normalized. It won't be something that will be new to them. So that's the idea there with the community outreach project um, and how it plays a role within our entire uh, overall initiative. Perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. And then the last thing for me, um, one of the things I think is an opportunity for your organization, and I think um, especially for the enrichment of DCs in California, um, I think mm -hmm. that um, we have a pretty robust continuing education um, apparatus um, in the state, um, and we have various levels of providers, but I think, and especially associations provide CE, I think that with your initiatives and your focus on education and enrichment for students. Um, I think that there's an opportunity for your organization, um, should you guys be interested, um, is to maybe look into becoming a, a CE provider in the state of California and providing some CE on some of the topics that you've expressed at this meeting. So I think that um, that's something that if you're interested in, I think that we have resources. Um, there's other CE providers in the state, other state associations um, that provide CE, but also um, guidance that um, should you be interested in becoming a provider that the, the board staff can help with um, you getting through the provider process. I think that's uh, something else that, yes. that you should consider. Yes, absolutely. And I and we are interested in that. Again, I, I say the robust grow, uh, goal is to have, you know, that type of approval in all states. But yes, we will most definitely reach out for that because, uh, and that was what Dr. Oberstein and I, com you know, conversed about yesterday. He, he is the one that put that out there and said he was going to work on it. He was like, if we can get one, we can get them all. And I said, yeah, so we, we will definitely be in touch about that because um, I think California is the first state that actually has, you know, even had these types of conversations with us about. So um, definitely, thank you so much for the support in that and be looking forward to working with you on getting that done, you all on getting that done. Thank you, Marcus, for that question, and uh, thank you, Dr. Edwards. Um, that that was really, really amazing to hear. And uh, I, I would just add, you know, also um, I think you know, fantastic to connect with the colleges, and um, but I think there's so many stakeholders um, in California, also including the the ACA, that has been reaching out to establish a more robust CE presence. Um, mm -hmm. and, and probably the state associations, et cetera. So um, that was fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. And uh, I'd like to open it up again. Um, if there's any uh, any more discussion or any final discussion, um, please feel free. Anyone from the board? Yeah, hearing none, um, moderator, can we open this up for public comment? This is the moderator and at the discretion of the board, I have opened the Q&A feature for the public. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within the square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. I am sharing the instructions on the screen for reference. In the ask field, typically in the lower right of the WebEx screen type, I would like to make a public comment and send it to all panelists. Any other communication will not be responded to. I will take comments in the order they are received. I will now pause for a moment to give public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. Board Chair, it does not appear as though we have received any requests for public comment. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please.
Feature is now closed. Um, so I'd like to just extend on behalf of the board our, our we're tremendously grateful um, for you doing that, Dr. Edwards, and please thank you and um, please extend our thanks to the full board and everyone at the ABCA for us. Um, so thank you again. Well, do thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. And again, um, if there's anything else that your board needs, feel free to reach us at any time. Uh, my my door is always open. And, and we extend the same courtesy. And I, I can tell you, um, you have as board chair um, and uh, as a, a future board member, um, even if I'm not the chair, you you have our full support to um, have, you know, attend your event in June of 2021. Awesome. Awesome. So awesome. We're looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. You all take care. Okay. So we're going to... Um, I think we're going to go to uh, item number 10, and then we have Dr. Fauché who can come on early. Correct me, um, Robert or Marcus, if I state this incorrect. We have Dr. Fauché who can come on at noon, and so we have 20 minutes to, to go to discuss in, um, item number 10, and, uh, and then we'll have Dr. Fauché coming on, and then I think we can break for lunch after that if, uh, if everyone's agreeable to that. Correct. Okay, so let's move on to uh, agenda item number 10, the update discussion and possible action on the submission of the waiver request for California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Division 4, and sections 331.7, calendar section 331.11, scholastic regulations, and section 3.12.2, curriculum. And uh, Robert, can you uh, can you lead that discussion for us and give us an update? Certainly. Um, so on um, June 23rd, I believe it was, we uh, we submitted this waiver request to the department. We we worked with um, with the schools, in particular, um, the three California schools who were um, who are members of um, the Association of Chiropractic Colleges, and so they were. Essentially speaking, on behalf of the um, of the whole association, all of the schools across the country, and these are um, th these are requested waivers that um, will help them get through this whole um, COVID uh, uh, state of emergency. And we so uh, the the waiver is in your packet, um, the waiver request that we submitted, and so we we identified provisions that were. Uh, very prescriptive and difficult to comply with, it, you know, requiring um, uh, students to be in seats and to, uh, you know, to class times and days of week and stuff, and with uh, with technology and the ability to um, teach via webinars and other um, online sources, uh, it's not, not necessary for for that. And but our law says that you know some of these things have to be complied with. Uh, so we're requesting um, that some of these provisions be waived, and uh, again, they're they're in uh, the board meeting materials. Uh, so um, we haven't received a response yet. Um, we're waiting. I anticipate um, getting a response soon, uh, but um, as of yet, we haven't. And as soon as we do, uh, I will disseminate that to the board members and stakeholders and let them know. Um, if the waiver has been granted um, entirely or in part. So um, I wish I had an update by today, but I don't, but um, th that, that will be forthcoming. So if anybody has any questions about the waiver request that we submitted, um, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, Robert, I have, I have a quick question. Um, this is Dr. Paris. It, um, soon, meaning, do we do we anticipate we will have a uh, a response and at some time, perhaps within the or early next week or within the next week? I'm hoping um, it will, this week's almost over, but um, you know, I'm hoping um, tomorrow or early next week. Uh, they, um, you know, I know they've had a lot of waiver requests, um, but they, you know, what we've asked is similar, some of the things that we've requested waived are similar to what other programs 
have asked. And so I, I, I think there's um, a good chance that uh, this, you know, they may not um, change things exact, exactly as we requested, but I think there's a good chance that um, we'll, we'll get a waiver that will help the school um, to, you know, move to a, a more a online or electronic um, teaching method and eliminate some of the um, overly restrictive requirements that um, need to be uh, that are in the regs right now. And um, as as you know, um, later in this meeting we'll be discussing our proposed regulation for curriculum requirements. And um, these are things that we intend to remove anyways because the um, the last time this reg was amended, um, they you know, the technology didn't exist to do some of the things and so uh, that we're, you know, that schools are doing now as far as um, webinars and online teaching. And so it wasn't anticipated and this, um, the way our regs are worded doesn't allow for that. And so we, it is time for, for them to be amended and, you know, to take out some of the overly prescriptive requirements. So um, we're, we're working on that, but in the meantime, um, the the, uh, the urgency has increased because of COVID and the need to social distance. And for a while there, um, the schools were completely closed. They uh, students couldn't even get on campus. And so um, hopefully now um, they they are going back to some classroom training. And but uh, but really going forward, I, I think it's a good idea to allow flexibility um, for um, how chiropractic education is delivered um, so that the schools can take advantage of uh, technological advancements and, um, and teach the way a lot of um, younger students, that's, that's the way that they learn um, and that they, so they're, you know, our, our regs are just outdated to, um, in a nutshell. So um, I, I'm hoping that this gets granted and also that we're able to move the regulation along and uh, and will address these issues and, and still ensure the quality of the education, but without the overly restrictive requirements. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, thank you. No, I, I thank you. I appreciate the detail. Um, is there, sorry. I have a question, um, Robert, it's Dion. Yeah. Um, so regarding the, uh, and maybe I missed this somewhere, um, the curricular changes, how will the competencies in the areas um, be established and monitored like in the physical exam areas because all of that is stricken out now basically? The regulations are, because um, um, the, the um, Council for Chiropractic Education, CCE, um, they, um, they set the standards for the college and, you know, and they determine the competencies that have to be met, but, but they don't require that the, um, that the education or knowledge be delivered in a certain format. So that's, um, and they're, they're the entity responsible for ensuring that it, the, the education is delivered, it, you know, in a, in a way that, that work, you know, that um, that is successful and that um, uh, uh, enables uh, students to obtain the competencies. Sorry, I don't have a better way to articulate that. But they, um, so we and our regs aren't necessarily consistent with the regulations of um, chiropractic boards across the country. So, you know, we, um, like many other professions, will be looking to the accreditors to ensure that uh, that the that education is delivered appropriately and then you know we're not the experts in education you know we regulate the profession but but we're not necessarily experts in accreditation and um, in delivering education so we would be deferring that to the accrediting body which is um, you know, which is recognized by the US Department for Education um, you know they they comply with the requirements and, and they have to um, report to you know, the the Department of Education is the oversight agency for the accrediting bodies and so they're they have laws that the accrediting bodies and the schools need to comply with and um, I think it's 
probably safe to say that our regs probably complicate things more than um, more than make them simpler for for students and for the schools. So it's um, just for clarification. It, so you're saying basically for all of the clinical competencies like exams and patient treatments and all of that. That's that's all, of course, handled by the um, accredita accreditation agency. Mm. They are in their monitoring or in their accredita accrediting the schools. They will have established that curricular already. Uh, um, correct. You know, because they do, um, they set the standards and they do inspections and, um, you, know, and you know, they do site visits and um, the schools have to report data to the accrediting bodies. And so it's not just the CCE, but then the CCE regulates the, uh, the curriculum, or not regulates, but they, they accredit the curriculum. And then there's regional accreditors for uh, for the administration of the school, and so there's there's a lot of oversight on the um, schools to ensure that they're delivering quality education, and you know we we want to ensure that if that the requirements are sufficient, that you know that students um, achieve the necessary education and knowledge they need to they practice chiropractic, and you know, we. We would essentially be referring or deferring. I'm sorry, deferring to the schools and the accrediting body, and as well as the oversight, the government oversight agencies that regulate them to ensure that um, the education is delivered in a quality and effective um, manner. And so, basically, our reg, our ultimate reg, will state that deference to that agency for that fact. Yeah, because because what what we'll be doing in our reg is um, is identifying um, or or and it's already in our law, but but you know, we identify the requirements for the accrediting body. And you know, right now um, CCE is the only chiropractic accrediting body that um, that meets the requirements. But but it's worded in a way that you know if there if CCE um, ceases to exist and they you know and they have a successor agency or if um, there's another accrediting body that, um, as long as they, you know, are at the same standards and meet the same requirements, um, we would be able to acknowledge them as well. And the board would always um, retain the ability to approve schools independently if that became necessary. Um, that would be part of the regulation too. So, um, but I'm kind of getting um, beyond because that's for the that's the regulation discussion and okay. so. It's, okay. um, but and, and this what we're doing for the waiver is, um, it, you know, isn't quite as substantive as, as what or what we request for the waiver as what the um, regulation changes will be. Certainly. So, okay. Thank you. So, so, Dr. McLean, I just want to speak really quick, um, specifically to what you asked for. With the waiver, and just like you said, those sections with um, the enumerated um, list of numbers of examinations like you talked about the physical examinations but cte and the reason why we feel comfortable with deferring to cte for that and striking those requirements is that for the curriculum they have a, a meta competency um based um curriculum whereas in ours and what we require um for licensure is basically numerical so it's all quantitative and so they've gone to a more holistic um, competency-based approach where the schools have to ensure that students are able to successfully do certain things, for example, like they have to demonstrate competency and comp saying like you need to do 25 or you need to see 250 patients. Like what their, their approach that CCE has taken says that the schools have to ensure that you can complete a physical examination and then they put an enumerated list of things that they believe um, encompass what a, phys a successful physical examination would include. And so they go through the process of school, whether it's first, second, third, or fourth year and learning these things. And over that time, I don't know specifically how each school does it, but I just imagine that, you know, they're demonstrating and then they're getting off, say like a check off, like, oh, you've, you've mastered that particular part of the examination. And then as you just go up through your school and your clinicals and your rotations, like you're learning these things and demonstrating it to the faculty and they're ensuring that, you know, they're meeting the competency requirements that way. So 
So instead of at the end of the year, did you do your 25 or do you, did you do your 250? They just have to demonstrate competency in doing whatever is required of them for that particular year. And so I think that's the the, heat, the difference between our current approach, which is um, outdated, and the current more comprehensive approach, in my opinion, that CCE has um, designated going forward. So, so this is uh, Dr. Paris. If I could just add to that briefly, we. So I think. Um, you know, under the under the standards, you know, the, those 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 for those would include like curriculum, clinical training, competencies, and and just as a brief overview, I you know, you would see uh, the programs turning in um, reports and self reports, and then having site visits, and those would confirm all the all the um, competencies are met. And, and that would include like clinical services, communi communication skills, professionalism. And so they have many categories uh, underneath underneath that as competencies and then, um, you know, objectives that they would uh, like to see met. And the, the colleges and um, anybody that goes through the accreditation process actually has very robust um, instruments and assessment tools that they then present to the CCE as those assurances of, you know, live clinical performances, um, chart recalls, chart reviews, and then and then they also, you know, case logs and um, and then they do like 360 assessments of each other. And it's a really robust system and it's it's really in depth and each college kind of has comes up with their way to meet those standards and those competencies. And, my suggestion, um, and and I'll bring it up at the at the end of the call here in future agenda. But I think it might be it might might be a benefit to the board and and the public and all of our stakeholders to have um, maybe reach out to Craig Little and see if he can come on and and kind of just do a brief demonstration of and and show a presentation and show us how that's you know pragmatically how is that done at you know, and how does how does CCE provide those assurances? Great, thanks. Um, any is it is there any other discussion on on uh, agenda item ten? Anything, uh, can we open this? I think we were just about to open it for public comment. Moderator, can we open this for public comment? This is the moderator and at the discretion of the board, I have opened the Q&A feature for public comment. If you would like to make a public comment, please follow the instructions being shared on the screen for your reference. It is not necessary to identify yourself in order to make a public comment, and I will take comments in the order that they are received. I will now pause a moment to give the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. Board Chair, it does not appear we have taken any requests from the attendees. Would you like me to close this feature? Um, yes, please. I do have a question. Can we, is there a way to see if there's uh, people in the queue or if there's, uh, does it identify if there's anybody from the colleges on that maybe might have trouble connecting or? I just want to make sure we don't miss any comment um, from any of those stakeholders. Unfortunately, it doesn't identify as to where it is that they're calling from. It does appear that we have about six members of the public currently on board. Okay, um, I, I, let's just give it one minute and we'll close that out. Thank you. You're welcome.
Again, if you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. I am sharing the instructions for reference. In the Ask field, typically in the lower right of the WebEx screen, type, I would like to make a comment and send it to all panelists. Any other communication will not be responded to. Please note that the Q&A feature is being used only as a means for the members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. Once unmuted, the member of the public may verbally state their comment. This is not a means to ask questions of the moderator or members of the board. Such inquiries submitted using this feature will not be answered. Okay, it looks like we're good. Thank you, um, moderator. We can close that. That feature has been closed. And so getting back to the agenda here, um, it looks like we have um, Dr. Fauché, um uh, Robert Marcus, please correct me if this is wrong. We have Dr. Fauché coming on in about five minutes. Um, so my suggestion would be that we take a quick uh, five minute break and we come back for Dr. Fauché's presentation and then we will break for lunch. Does that, that meet with that approval? Sounds perfect, yes. Okay, um, do we need to do anything moderator? We're gonna break for five minutes and uh, we'll be back um, at at noon oh, actually it looks like my looks like we have about 1151 right now so um so eight or nine minutes yeah we have about eight or nine minutes so um and we'll be back at uh noon sharp for dr Fauché's presentation we will display the meeting is in recess 